Hello and welcome to Chapter 19, Diseases of the Eyes, Ears, Nose, and Throat Lecture. This chapter provides knowledge of the anatomy, physiology, epidemiology, pathophysiology, and psychosocial impact, presentations, prognosis, and management of diseases of the eyes, ears, nose, and throat. So let's get started. Paramedics may respond to calls involving disorders of the eyes, ears, nose, and throat, EENT. So a specific number of these calls involve trauma. Familiarity with the EENT conditions will help you when assessing the patient. Also, allows you to educate the patient on prevention or potential care. So patients may need to be transported to the emergency department with access to an eye specialist, or an ear, nose, and throat specialist. So let's talk about the eyes first. So let's do an anatomy and physiology review. So connection to the brain by two nerves. There's the ocular motor nerve, and that's the third cranial nerve. It inerts the muscles that cause motion of the eyeballs and upper eyelids, and it carries parasympathetic nerve fibers that cause constriction of the pupil and accommodation of the lens. And then there's the optic nerve. It's the second cranial nerve, and it provides the sense of vision. This figure shows the structures of the eyes. And this figure shows the lacral system of the tear ducts and glands. Okay, so the patient assessment. So you want to ensure scene safety and keep your patient calm. Inform the general impression, note the environmental clues at the scene, and note the approximate age and sex of the patient. Assess airway and breathing and rule out life threats. Do not be distracted by swollen or irritated eye and miss priorities. Early transport may improve outcomes, so cover both eyes to limit damage to the affected eye through the sympathetic movement. Consider pain management and cardiac monitoring is, is recommended. So ocular pressure can stimulate the vagal nerve. Eye drops medications can cause side effects such as low or high blood pressure. So provide emotional care and obtain the chief complaint in history and the OPQRST, such as when do the symptoms begin and what symptoms are they experiencing and are both eyes affected. So symptoms that may include a serious ocular condition include vision loss that does not improve when the patient blinks, double vision, a foreign eye pain, or foreign body sensation. Perform a thorough exam and use standard precautions. Avoid aggravating the affected area. So assess for the pain, swelling, abnormal movement sensation, circulatory changes, deformity, and vision changes, and of course, airway compromise. And assess for the following visible ocular structures. So you want to, in the orbital ring, you want to check for ecchymosis, swelling, lacerations, or tenderness. Also check in the eyelids for the same, and in the corneas for any foreign bodies that you could see. In the conjunctiva, you're looking for redness, pus, in, inflammation, or foreign bodies. And in the globe, uh, the redness or an abnormal pigmentation or lacerations. On the eye surface, you're looking for any gross or discoloration. In the pupils, you want to make sure that the pupils are perla, pupils equal, round, reactive to light, and accommodation. When assessing ocular function, perform the following test. And so there's a vision acuity test, and you want to assess the ability to see large and small letters and test each eye separately and document the results. And then the peripheral test, so test the ability to recognize an object entering the extremities of the visual field. Also ocular motility, so check the ability for the eyes to move in all directions and check for paralysis of gaze or discoordination between the movements of the two eyes. And that is, um, the word for that is disconjugate gaze. You want to obtain a full set of vitals and reassess every 5 or 15 minutes, depending on the patient's condition, and ask the patient how he or she administered any medication 
he or she has used, generally recommended to wait five minutes between the first and second drop. So eye drops are used for conjunctivitis, uh, dry or eye itchy eyes, eye pain, glaucoma, eye surgery or herpes simplex, corneal abrasions or lubrication. And eye drops and lubricants can be applied by gently squeezing the lower eyelid to make a pouch and applying the medication to the lower lid. Having the patient close the eyes and roll them downward and uh, ask the patients what medications they have already taken. Irrigation may be necessary for chemical or thermal burns, so use sterile water or some type of isotonic saline solution and flush liquid from the inside of the corner to the out. I should be seen in the emergency department and um, eye injuries may be irreversible, so communication is the key to keeping the patient calm and informed. Um, early decisions to transport can improve some outcomes. All right, so contact lenses, some patients will be wearing them, and the only indication for removing the lenses in the pre-hospital setting is for a chemical burn. So there are three types of lenses, hard, rigid, or soft. And to remove a hard contact lens, use a small suction cup moistened with uh, at the end with saline. And to remove a soft one, just place two drops of saline in the eye and gently pinch the lens between your gloved thumb and index finger and lift it off the surface of the eye. Advise emergency department staff if the patient was wearing contact lenses or if they still are. Next, we're going to talk about eye prosthesis. So suspect the patient has an eye prosthesis. If the patient does not respond to light or the eye, the eye does not move in concert with the other, or the eye does not appear quite the same as the opposite. The patient says he or she has one. Okay, so um, an ophthalmoscope. So practitioners in the hospital or physician's office, they may use one of these. So they're rarely used by paramedics and they consist of a concave mirror with a battery powered light, usually um, contained in a, the device's handle and a rotating section of the lens and adjustable depth and magnification. So their effective evaluation of the eye with this device requires dilation of the patient's pupils and significant diagnostics experience. But for steps for use, um, you could check out the skill drill on 19-1. Okay, so let's talk about conjunctivitis. Uh, conjunctivitis is basically pink eye. It's a condition where the conjunctiva, and that's the thin layer that lies, lines inside the eyelids, and the white of the eye becomes inflamed and red. Most often starts in one eye and sometimes spreads to the other, it's most often caused by bacteria, viruses, allergies, or chemicals. A viral conjunctivitis is often associated with an upper respiratory virus. Bacterial conjunctivitis is caused by a bacterial infection. And viral and bacterial forms are highly contagious. Allergy conjunctivitis is caused by a trigger or an irritating allergen such as pollen and also chlorine in swimming pools and air pollution are potential causes of chemical conjunctivitis. If conjunctivitis is due to a foreign body, the eye will begin to produce tears in an attempt to flush out the object. You wanna perform a general assessment of the patient's vision, including the visual acuity and pupils, peripheral vision and eye movement. Viral conjunctivitis normally resolves on its own Bacterial conjunctivitis requires a topical antibiotic. Severe allergic conjunctivitis may need non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or an antihistamine or topical steroid. Inflammation of the eyelid the, uh, is what we're going to talk about next. And so a protective film of oil glands and oil ducts Across the eye. Okay, so there's two types of inflammation, um, a small swollen bump or pustule on the external eyelid formed by blockage and swelling of an oil gland is the first one. And the second one is commonly referred to as a sty, and that's the infection of an oil gland that produces a red tender lump in the eye or at the lid margin. 
A thorough assessment of vital signs history and transport for physician evaluation is warranted, and the patient will usually be asked to apply warm compress compresses every four, five to ten minutes several times a day, and topical or oral antibiotics may be prescribed. Okay, so there's a group of conditions that lead to increased intraocular pressure, and this is glaucoma. It's one of the leading causes of blindness. Aqueous humor, the clear watery fluid that fills the eye's anterior chamber, maintains intraocular pressure, provides nutrients to the inner surface of the eye, and helps to bend the light. There are several types of glaucoma. There's open angle glaucoma, and that is when the fluid drains too slowly and pressure builds up within the eye and damages the optic nerve. This is the most common type of glaucoma, and that's open angle glaucoma. Then there's normal tension glaucoma. It can cause vision changes with no increase in interocular pressure. And then there is narrow angle glaucoma. That's when the aqueous fluid does not drain properly due to narrowing of the drainage channel. And then posterior pressure builds up in the chamber of the eye, which pushes the lens forward. Secondary glaucoma is a result of conditions that damage the drainage channel in the eye, such as diabetes or uh, leukemia or sickle cell. Um, chances increase with age and usually treated with eye drops to reduce the ocular pressure. So the assessment and management, if the patient complains, may involve loss of field of vision. And patients who have an acute attack of narrow angle glaucoma, glaucoma may result severe pain or headache or photophobia blurred vision or halos. Uh, the cornea may look cloudy and uh, pupils often have irregular margins and can be fixed in a mid position and dilated. So rule out trauma and physical injury and perform a general eye assessment. So central retinal artery occlusion. This is a condition in which the blood supply to the retina becomes blocked because of a clot or emboli in the central retinal artery or one of its branches. So possible causes include an embolus from a carotid artery, um, heart disease, drug abuse, or fat emboli, um, perhaps an arterial spasm or oral contraceptive use. So may cause partial blindness, which may be temporary or permanent. So patients with central retinal arterial occlusion usually seek medical assistance because of the sudden painless loss of vision. So vision loss in central retinal vein occlusion may progress over 30 to 120 minutes. Immediate transport in a situation involving a rapid loss of vision is warranted. So next we're going to talk about iritis, and that's inflammation of the iris. It's the third leading preventable cause of blindness. It can be acute or chronic, so acute caused by trauma or irritants, and usually affects only one eye. Uh, chronic causes could be autoimmune diseases, uh, irritable bowel disease, or Crohn's disease, and infections causes um, include Lyme disease or tuberculosis. So iritis uh, presents as a red area surrounding the iris, cloudy vision, and usually sh unusually shaped pupil. So the acute usually responds well to topical corticosteroids as long as the cause is not fungal, viral, or bacterial. So 90 different pathogens or autoimmune processes can cause this. Um, so patients should be referred to a specialist. So papillary edema, that's resulting from swelling or inflammation of the optic nerve at or at the rear part of the eye. So symptoms are headaches, nausea with vi possible vomiting, temporary vision loss or narrowing vision fields, or a graying in the field of vision. So it could be caused by tumors or an abscess or an inner ear infection, dental infections or meningitis, fever, high blood pressure, chronic high blood pressure, or the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Diagnosis will be needed by an ophthalmologist or physician. So uh, pre-hospital management, G treating symptoms and transporting and assessing the A uh, ABCs. Next, we're going to talk about cellulitis of the orbit, and it's a periorbital or orbital cellulitis. 
And so it's more prevalent in children than adults. It's known as uh, cellulitis or eyelid cellulitis. It presents as a painful red swollen eyelid. Uh, it's predisposed um, insect bites or upper respiratory disorders or trauma. And the orbital cellulitis is an infection within the eye socket. It's considered a medical emergency. The goal of treatment is to avoid the formation of an abscess. And there's predisposed risk factors such as sinusitis or tooth infections, facial or middle ear infections or trauma, or sinus infection. So treatment in children is usually IV antibiotics, and adults are generally treated with oral antibiotics. Pre-hospital management includes ruling out life threats or and obtaining a thorough history. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about, it's pretty common, is the corneal abrasion or ulcer. So it's when uh, the cornea, that's the transparent outer covering of the eye, um, it has some type of trauma or foreign body, or, um, possibly contact lens or exposure to ultraviolet radiation. It's the most common eye injury seen in the emergency departments. It can cause blindness if un, uh, left untreated, so um, an ulcer can develop. So signs and symptoms are pain, redness, excessive tearing, sensation of having something in, a, in their eye, um, and blurred vision or photophobia, also headache. Pre-hospital management, you need to rule out the life threats, of course, and take a thorough history and then transport promptly. Okay, so after the eyes, we're going to talk about the ears, and the primary structures for hearing and balance are the ears. Disorders and injuries can leave a person unable to communicate, react, and maintain equilibrium. Changes in ear pressure can cause ear discomfort, and tumors on cranial nerves can affect the inner ear balance, facial sensation, eye movement, and facial movement, taste, and hearing. The ear is divided into three autotomic parts. And so you have the external, the middle, and the inner. And uh, you could see the three different parts on the uh, slide. Sound waves travel through the ear, and then the internal ear structures form nerve impulses that travel to the brain via the auditory nerve. The brain converts these impulses into sound. So possible ear injuries include foreign objects or ear infections or blast pressure waves, which can burst the eardrum. You want to observe the scene to rule out any hazards to EMS personnel and crew. And as you approach, um, try and get the age and sex of the patient, environmental conditions, uh, the patient's degree of distress, and whether the patient is wearing a hearing aid. And ensure airway patency, breathing adequacy, and circulation. Manage life threats and take a complete history. You also want to observe the ears for drainage or excess earwax, inflammation, and swelling. Have the patient rate his or her pain using uh, the OPQRST. And ask the patient about changes in hearing or ten tendinitis, uh, dizziness, wound swelling, or drainage. Also look for battle signs, and uh, that's uh, on that mastoid process of the skull. An otoscope is used to visualize abnormalities of the internal canal and uh, tympatic membrane. So an otoscope consists of a head and a handle, and the head contains an electric light source and a low power, power magnifying glass. The front of the headpiece is an attached for disposable plastic eardrum, and the examiner inserts a speculum into the ear and looks through the lens on the rear of the headpiece. Typically, paramedics must work in an expanded scope of practice and receive additional training from their medical director to use this otoscope. Um, refer to skill drill 19-2. Okay, so another common uh, thing that happens is impacted cerumen. So it's a yellowish oily substance found in the outer ear canal, and it's ear wax, basically. It helps prevent dirt and water from entering the middle ear 
canal and may protect the ear from bacteria and fungus. So it may present as wet uh, or a sticky brown color or dry and a grayish flaky substance. It can become impacted and cause pressure against that eardrum. So there are risk factors and it's more common in older adults. Abnormal ear canal shape um, can cause it and improper use of cotton swabs uh, or q-tips and so some symptoms are dizziness or pressure or fullness of the ears ringing of the ears or loss of hearing pre-hospital treatment includes a thorough history and a visual inspection of the ear so treatment is aimed at removing the excess cerumen and do not attempt to uh, extract the material self if left untreated, infection and irritation can occur, so follow-up is necessary. Okay, so next we're going to talk about labyrinthitis, and this is the most commonly recognized as a feeling of vertigo or loss of balance after an ear infection or upper respiratory infection. Its effect on the nerves of the inner ear and the loss of balance from irritation and swelling of the inner ear. So um, symptoms are ringing in the ears or dizziness, loss of hearing, or nausea and vomiting. Pre-hospital treatment just uh, includes reducing the severity of the nausea and vomiting and transporting the position, patient in the position of comfort. Serious disorders will need to be ruled out by a CAT scan and an MRI. And so um, possible treatment includes an antiemetic for nausea and vomiting or an antihistamine for swelling or an anti-vertigo medicine and diazepam as a sedative also. So next we're gonna talk about Meniere's disease, and that's a chronic condition of the inner ear characterized by dizziness, described as a spinning vertigo or low frequency hearing loss, um, feeling of fullness in the affected ear. It involves the overproduction and defective absorption of fluid, which increases the volume and pressure within the labyrinth of the inner ear. So the mixture disrupts the balance of fluid and electrolytes and damages the vestibule and cochlear hair, hair cells. The attacks of less than two hours in the early stages altered balance of up to two days. As the disease progresses, symptoms last hours to days. And then permanent tinnitus, moderate to severe hearing loss, and chronic unsteadiness may result. So assessment and management. So pre-hospital care includes treating the nausea and vomiting with an antiemetic and the physician may treat with diuretics and also an antiemetic. So odorous externa and media, it's an infection that results in the bacterial growth in the ear canal. So um, you have the externa, which is the infection in the outer ear and a media, which is the infection in the middle. More common in a, children than adults and most common bacterial infections. So the otis externa may also be an allergic or fungal reaction, and the otis media can be virally induced. So signs and symptoms are pain, itching, and uh, diminished hearing, and inflamed, uh, bulging tympanic membrane on exam with the otoscope. Um, Pre-hospital treatment should be directed at relieving unbearable symptoms, and in the hospital setting, antibiotics may be administered. The nose is what we're going to talk about next, and it's susceptible to injury because of the prominent location on the face. The nose acts as a filter, humidifier, and heater for air that enters the body. Allergens, particles, and chemicals can cause inflammation, infection, and injury. And there are complications from nasal disorders are very common. And the inside of the nose is extremely vascular. It's an excellent route for some medicines and faster uh, even than intravenous administration. So loss of smelling and sensation has many causes. Aging, smoking, allergies, um, polyps, flu, medications, traumatic brain injury. And there are some uh, smelling disorders. Um, and so anatomy and physiology review, so one to two primary entry points for oxygen. It warms and humidifies, as I said on the last slide, as air enters the body. It contains bony structures and it's connected with the sinuses. 
So uh, when you're doing a patient assessment, look for environmental clues and ensure the scene's safe. Determine whether the airway and breathing are sufficient and determine the patient's level of consciousness. The vascular nature of the nasal cavities makes them susceptible to bleeding, now, severe nosebleed and or condition that blocks the airway with swelling or blood is life-threatening. So insert an airway adjunct if needed, but do not insert the NP or attempt any type of nasotracheal innovation in a patient with a suspected nasal fracture or CSF or blood leakage from the nose. And inquire about previous history of nose conditions and always consider a hypertensive crisis when an older person has a nosebleed. So um, we're going to talk about epistasis next, and that's the word for nosebleed. Um, it's most common causes digital trauma. So picking your nose, other causes are dryness and hypertension. There are two types of nosebleeds, and there is the anterior and then the posterior. So the anterior is most typically um, occurs in, in the front area, usually self-limiting and can resolve quickly. Then the posterior is usually more severe, often cause blood and drainage to the back of the throat, and can cause um, some nausea and vomiting. So when you're talking about the assessment and management, Try to estimate the amount of blood loss and place a non-trauma patient in a sitting position, leaning forward and pinch his or her nostrils together. Direct the patient not to sniff or blow his or her nose. With a foreign body, it's most likely to be seen in pediatric patients and pressure in the nasal passage can cause some tissue necrosis, inflammation and swelling. So tissue ulceration and epistasis are caused by inflammation and sinusitis caused by nasal blockage. So determine if a foreign body pre um, presents a life-threatening condition. You may be able to see it, um, any persistent foul swell smelling or any discharge from the nares should lead to suspicion of a foreign body. And transport the patient in the position of comfort and pain management or sedation, it may be necessary. Rhinitis, and that's an inflammation in the nasal cavity. It may be caused by bacterial viral infections, and it can also be caused by certain medications or foreign bodies or irritants in the ear. Also hormonal uh, changes in pregnancy. So signs and symptoms are nasal congestion, swelling, or sneezing, itchy runny nose, or post-nasal drip, and keep the patient in the Fowler's position and provide transport. Sinusitis is a sinus inflammation. It occurs when drainage from the sinuses becomes disruptive and sinuses become colonized with nasal bacteria and infected. Facial pressure and pain, sore throat, nasal congestion, toothache, headache, fever, chills, and muscle aches. Uh, it affects about 29.3 million adults per year, according to the CDC. Young children and older adults are also more susceptible. So the condition can be chronic, acute, or reoccurrent. Pre-hospital management should include treatment of any respiratory compromise. Um, treatment is aimed at reducing inflammation and draining the sinuses. So mild to moderate symptoms can be treated with a saline rinse, and antibiotics are typically prescribed after seven to 10 days. Okay, next we're gonna talk about disorders of the throat, and they could ha be acute inflammation and infections, chronic inflammation, or abnormal growths. Specific disorders could include vocal cord polyps or nodules, contact ulcers, or vocal cord paralysis, um, or cancer. So throat infections are common in children, and throat problems can be exacerbated by swallowing problems. Cranial nerve 6, 7, 9, and 12 all play a role in swallowing. Tronic problems associated with stroke and trauma can also um, make swallowing difficulty. And aspiration pneumonia is a life-threatening condition. Pre-hospital uh, treatment of aspiration involves maintaining a patent airway, ensuring adequate breathing and close monitoring of the vital signs and prompt transport for definitive care. Esophageal disorders can be, they can affect the throat, 
the um, valve at the end of the esophagus keeps acid stomach uh, contents from coming back up in the throat. So in esophageal reflex, the valve only partially closes or opens too much. So symptoms include burning sensation, ingestion or a change in voice, and can cause precancerous condition. So um, when you talk about anatomy and physiology, uh, assessment begins at opening the mouth with the teeth. And you could see on this slide some of the uh, anatomy and physiology. So when you talk about the um, different trigeminal or facial nerve supply, the mouth and its structures, and uh, you could see on this uh, slide the different nerves that uh, supply the mouth. The neck consists of the anterior and posterior portions. The anterior part of the neck includes the thyroid and cricoid cartilage, the trachea, and numerous muscles and nerves. And there's also major blood vessels, so the internal and external carotid arteries and the internal and external jugular veins. And the vertebrae arteries run laterally to the cervical vertebra in the posterior part of the neck. And you can see that really good picture um, on the slide. And this figure shows the veins of the neck. Okay, so when you're talking about the patient assessment, um, patients with swallowing abnormalities or copious mucus production should be placed in a position that allows drainage. So assessing stroke patients must include early recognition of airway threats. And for patients who cannot protect their airways and are at risk for aspiration to the lungs, intubate should be, intubation should be considered. In your assessments, you should consider epiglottis, ep epiglottitis if the symptoms are sore throat, drooling, or forward hanging head. And then you have uh, dental abscesses. And so um, a toothache base basically can be the start of a dental abscess. A dental abscess occurs when bacterial growth spreads directly from the cavity of the gums, facial tissue, bones, or neck. And it may have to be drained surgically. So uh, infection may have become systemic if the patient has fever, chills, nausea, or vomiting, and an abscess in the throat, neck, or under the tongue can affect the ability to breathe. So pre-hospital treatment is aimed at relieving the symptoms and drainage into the mouth should be rinsed with warm water. You should encourage transport. Next, we're gonna talk about diseases of the oral soft tissue and it can be a root cause of other health problems. So gum disease has been linked to heart disease. Some common mouth disorders are cold sores or canker sores, oral um, candinitis, and that's thrush, or leukoplakia, and that's caused by excess cell growth in the mouth, cheek, or gums. Um, also gingivitis, that's red swollen gums, or bad breath, and that's usually linked to plaque or poor oral hygiene. So rule out urticaria and allergic reactions for the assessment and management. And also thrush. So that is a condition in which um, you, you have a fungus that accumulates on the lining of the mouth. It's creamy white lesions on the tongue and inner cheeks. And it may be painful and it may bleed as they are rubbed or scraped. Thrush is most likely to be found in babies or patients with compromised immune systems. Also patients who wear dentures or patients who use inhaled corticosteroids. It's um, painful and uh, cracking and redness in the corners of the mouth or in lack of taste. Also a cottony feeling in the mouth. In severe cases, lesions can move down the esophagus, causing the sensation that food is getting stuck in the throat when swallowing. Patients have an increased risk um, if they have the history of HIV or AIDS or cancer, diabetes, or yeast infections. So um, treat higher priorities and make the patient comfortable and uh, use standard precautions. Lugwig angina. So this is a type of cellulitis caused from bacteria from an infected tooth, root, or mouth injury. It occurs on the floor of the mouth under the tongue, and it's rapid swelling and, and airway obstruction redness and swelling of the neck or under the chin, and the tongue may also be swollen. An airway through um, the nasal passages possibly might be needed. 
So the symptoms are going to be difficulty breathing or difficulty swallowing, neck pain, neck swelling, fever, drooling, and altered speech sounds. Pre-hospital treatment requires aggressive management of the airway in some cases and contact medical control early on. Remain calm and organized. Attend the basic ABCs and play, per, pay particular attention to the condition and smells originating in the mouth. Also, epiglottitis, so that's the inflammation of the epiglottis. It blocks the trachea and obstructs the airway. It's uh, often a result of the type B virus influenza. They're going to have fever and a sore throat, peripheral swallowing, strider. Remember that upper airway blockage, uh, respiratory distress, and patients will look sick and anxious, and they'll sit up in the classic tripod position or in a sniffing position. And usually they'll be drooling, uh, work of breathing will be increased, and cyanosis may be evident. You need to transport to the appropriate facility while maintaining that airway, minimize scene time, and do not attempt procedures that could agitate the patient. And do not attempt to look in the mouth, alert receiving personnel of suspected diagnosis and patient condition. Right, laryngitis, so this is swelling and inflammation of the laryn larynx associated with hoarseness and loss of voice, and it can be a result of overuse. Most common form caused by a virus, though, so it uh, could be caused by pneumonia or irritants or chemicals, or also gastroesophageal reflex disease or bronchitis, allergies, and bacterial infections. Symptoms could include fever, hoarseness, or swollen lymph nodes or glands in the neck. Obtain that good history to rule out a evolving upper airway obstruction or allergic reaction, and consider fracture of the hyoid bone. Have the patient follow up with the physician. Tracheitis, so that's a bit a bacterial infection of the trachea and uh, frequently occurs in children following an upper respiratory infection. The trachea is easily blocked by swelling, so it can be life-threatening. Um, symptoms include that croup-like cough, difficulty breathing, high fever, or high-pitched strider. Um, they'll be in the tripod position with intercostal retractions, and they can proceed from respiratory distress to full respiratory failure if not addressed. You need to minimize stress and administer 100% oxygen. Use the pulse ox and monitor vital signs and be prepared for intubation. And have the correct ET tube as well as smaller sizes. And then transport promptly to the appropriate facility. Tonsillitis, that's swelling of and inflammation of the tonsils. And it's usually caused by a, vi a viral infection and it can also be caused by bacteria. Symptoms include swollen tonsils or sore throat, and patients will present with the following. So red swollen tonsils, white or yellow coating or patches on the tonsils, fever, sore throat, pain when swallowing or enlarged or tender lymph nodes, bad breath or headache, stiff neck and drooling. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the pharyngitis, and that's inflammation of the pharynx. It's often due to uh, to a rapid onset of a sore throat without discomfort or pain with swallowing. Symptoms are going to be fever um, or headache or a patchy yellow, gray, or white, nasal congestion, hoarseness, cough, or ulcers on the soft palate. Treatment involves follow-up to the emergency department, and a major pre-hospital concern is assessment for partial airway obstruction. So a collection of infected material around the tonsils is that uh, peritonsillitis abscess in the complication of tonsillitis. And of course, one or both of the tonsils are infected. The roof of the mouth and the neck and or chest can be infected. And their patients are going to have chills, difficulty opening their mouth, facial swelling or fever, drooling or an inability to swallow the saliva, headache, muffled voice, sore throat, and tender glands, uh, the jaw in the throat. Antibiotics in draining the abscess may be needed, and hospital transport, in some cases, condition may be life-threatening. The next thing we're going to talk about is TMJ, so that's that temporal mandibular joint disorder, 
And that's where the um, basically the mandible articulates with the temporal man, um, membrane bone, and it allows movement. And um, the, the, when they have this TMJ, uh, it's basically arthritis damage to that joint cartilage or jaw injury or jaw muscle fatigue from grinding or clenching teeth. Okay. When it comes to assessment and management of TMJ, uh, the, the symptoms are going to have a headache or jaw pain or aching around the ear, an uneven bite or painful bite, difficulty chewing, and locking of the joint, causing difficulty opening or closing their mouth. Um, this is usually managed by the patient's physician or dentist. Okay, so that concludes uh, Chapter 19, Diseases of the Eyes, Ears, Nose, and Throat Lecture. Thank you for joining us tonight. And if you like this lecture, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. We're going to be going through all of the uh, different chapters. All right, have a great night.